Good evening, Tracy. Hello. <laughs> so I hope everybody's well. Thank you for coming. And uh, this is Edgar Allan Poe and his monstrous women. So first of all, Poe and his actual women. It can hardly be doubted that Poe was a disturbed and tormented man, whose many biographers have described him variously as a sadomasochist, an alcoholic and drug addict, when in fact he never used drugs in his life, a manic depressive, a sex pervert, because Virginia was only nine when he first met her, and 14 when they married, and an egomaniac. But while Poe's mental state may account for the tone and themes to which he repeatedly returned to in his fiction, we must also take into consideration the life of the man who wrote that fiction. In doing so, we note the common denominator of feminine abandonment and thus perceived betrayal, leading to a prominent feature of his stories, the conflation of beauty with death. Beautiful women have little chance of survival in Poe. They are often seen both as the victims of men and a cause of destruction. The characters of Bernice, Legia, Lady Rowena and Marilyn Usher can be read as both beautiful and horrific shadows existing only in the mind of the narrator. Each character is portrayed as representing a sexuality of perverseness, and each is indeed both a victim and or a cause of destruction. Poe's women are spectres, idealised images drained of blood, sometimes literally, providing the necessary connection between Eros and Thanatos that undergirds Poe's whole oeuvre. Eros and Thanatos are the two major forces of all human impulse, the love and the death drives of the id. Eros is a force which seeks unity and wholeness. Thanatos is a force seeking disunification and destruction. Poe's women, both real and fictional, begin by seeking love and unity, but ultimately end in death and disunification. And that didn't work, so I'll have to do it this way. There we go. As Poe wrote in The Philosophy of Composition in 1846, the death then of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world. And equally, is it beyond doubt that the lips best suited for such a topic are those of a bereaved lover? Poe was a bereaved lover many times throughout his short life, each death compounding a morbid equation of beauty with mortality, combined with what he saw as a monstrous betrayal by the female in both nature and nurture. Poe lost an unusual number of beautiful, relatively young, nurturing females in his lifetime. His mother, Eliza Poe, had already contracted tuberculosis before his death. She died when Edgar was two. She was only 24. And bear in mind, Edgar was one of three children. At 14, a school friend, Robert Stannard, invited Poe to the Stannard's house, where Robert's mother, Jane, herself only 30 at the time, took Poe's hand and spoke some gentle words of welcome. Poe became besotted with her. She died insane a year later. Make of that what you will. Poe's foster mother, Frances Allen, who loved him unconditionally and to whom he was totally devoted, died when Poe was 20. In 1836, Poe married his cousin, Virginia, whom he nicknamed Sissy. He was 27, she was 14. Almost all of these key biographical figures show signs of consumption, a disease that kills its victims without destroying their appearance, a circumstance further influencing the conflation of love and beauty with death, prevalent throughout Poe's work. 
It has been said that Poe possessed an unerring ability to choose frail or in some way damaged women and that he regarded his relationships with women as ideal or spiritual in temper rather than sexual. From this we may surmise that of all things Poe truly feared, that of female withdrawal was by far the most painful. And yet in a letter to his friend George Eveleth after Virginia's funeral, Poe declared with regards to his writer's block, I had indeed nearly abandoned all hope of a permanent cure when I found one in the death of my wife. Being abandoned by these women was undoubtedly devastating, but it also served as a release for Poe's psychic energies in the form of a creative muse. In fiction, Poe was able to contain his women, to punish the recurring lack of feminine nurturing that early death brought to the betrayed male. Three tales featuring this theme are Bernice of 1835, my personal favourite, Legia 1838, and The Fall of the House of Usher, 1839. Each of these stories are narratives of obsession, featuring female incarceration and objectification, and containing what is seen as feminine monstrousness. Benice and Lady Rowena Trevanion are the wives of the narrator in their respective tales, and Lady Madeline is the twin sister to that narrator's friend in the third. Each of these women are reduced to the sum of their physical features rather than described in terms of personality. The exception to this is Legia whose intellect and presence are delineated in infinite detail. And coincidentally, she is the only woman of the four featured here who is not a victim, but in fact the cause of the destruction of another female. Teeth, hair, eyes and skin are fetishized to an extreme degree until each woman becomes a creature which must be contained. Once contained, there can be no abandonment or betrayal. The unheimlich, forgive me Paul if I didn't pronounce that properly, feminine monstrousness. Many critics have written on the female monster, otherwise known as the monstrous feminine, including various forms such as the witch, the bleeding wound, the possessed body. The monstrous feminine embodies what it is about women that is shocking, terrifying, horrific and abject, and explores Freud's notion of the castrated or castrating mother in order to expose male anxieties surrounding female power. And that's Freud for you. The majority of these critics, by no means all of whom are female, see the representation of women as monstrous, as being in most cases related to the functions of mothering and reproduction, and thus linked to notions of sexual desire. As Poe's stories are remarkable for their lack of representing sexual desire, I propose that it is an unheimlich or uncanny monstrousness that is brought into play in his stories, channeled through the female as a receptor for male repression. Literary theorist Georges Canguem remarked that the monstrous is the marvellous inverted, but it is marvellous nonetheless. On the one hand, it disconcerts. On the other, it valorizes. The instances of feminine monstrousness in Poe's stories are indeed marvelous, causing awe and wonder and not a little trepidation for the male protagonists seeking to contain what they cannot control. In the figures of Bernice, Legia and Madeline Usher, the marvelous disconcerts both narrator and reader 
with its re recourse to the uncanny. But it also valorizes a femininity whose partial or limited existence is ultimately uncontainable. Two categories of the monstrous feminine are of particular relevance here. The woman as life in death and woman as the deadly femme castratrice. Hope the men there love that picture. The women too, perhaps. I like a nighty. Wish I could wear something like that. But anyway, Madeline Usher and Legia are both symbols of feminine monstrousness as life in death. And Bernice is the unwitting castratrice, whose teeth are removed by the narrator in order to gain mastery over the ideas they represent. The male protagonists of these three stories each suffer from hypersensitivity and almost aesthetic insanity, rendering defective the sense of sight, sound and taste. Their unstable psyches are translated as perverted quests for a monstrous form of love. The monstrousness being transferred onto the female object of devotion who seemingly perishes from a wasting disease only to return in an embodiment of Freud's unheimlich, the unhomely monstrous, which should remain suppressed, but reappears, evoking fear and dread. Freud was the pioneer in the science of monstrous feelings. He posits that the unheimlich, or the uncanny, is caused by the return of the repressed, something that was long familiar to the psyche, but has become estranged. Bernice, Legia and Madeline each embody feminine monstrousness, a masculine projection of womanhood unrestrained by the duty to nurture the male, unsuccessfully repressed by their male counterparts, and thus seeing each return in a perverted act of monstrous consummation. Story number one. Bernice is a morbid and macabre tale, one of Poe's earliest, it set the tone for what was to follow. It was published in the supposedly genteel pages of the Southern Literary Messenger in 1835, with the effect of an affront. Its air of madness and desecration violating the magazine's standard of propriety. The publisher, Thomas Willis White, had criticised it as being far too horrible, to which Poe replied that the most successful stories contained the ludicrous heightened into the grotesque, the fearful coloured into the horrible, the witty exaggerated into the burlesque, the singular wrought out into the strange and mystical. You say, oh, this is bad taste. I have my doubts about it. What Poe referred to as the grotesque and the arabesque, or other words, licentiousness and transcendence, is a recurring theme throughout his tales. The ludicrous nature of the protagonist's obsession with teeth in Bernice is heightened into the grotesque by the method with which he chooses to appease his monomania. Bernice is one of the first pieces of fiction to mention the condition of monomania by name, a psychosis characterized by obsessive thoughts confined to a single idea. Not officially recognized until 1845, with the publication of the French physician Jean Etienne Escouot's Mental Maladies, a treatise on insanity, it was viewed as a partial insanity comprising a single pathological preoccupation. Thus far, only two examples predate Poe's usage. Balzac's Eugénie Grandet of 1833, and a painting of 1822 by Theodore Jericho, titled Insane Woman or Monomania of Envy. Poe anticipated Escouot's theories 
by a decade, featuring the condition in both Venice and Ligia, and also in the Telltale Heart of 1843. For anybody that's familiar with that story, the blue eye. The protagonist of Venice, the psychologically morbid Aegeus, describes himself early in the narrative as diseased. My own disease grew rapidly upon me and assumed finally a monomaniac character of a novel and extraordinary form, hourly and momently gaining vigour and at length obtaining over me the most incomprehensible ascendancy. The focus of Aegeus's idea fixe is teeth, specifically those of his young cousin, Bernice, to whom he became betrothed in a moment of spite when he noticed that she was suffering from a mysterious wasting disease, which thus ensured the negation of procreation and nurturing. Aegeus has never felt any kind of love or warmth for his cousin, but once her emaciation becomes excessive and he contemplates her thin and shrunken lips, which part in a smile of peculiar meaning, the teeth of the changed Venice disclosed themselves slowly to my view, would to God that I had never beheld them or that having done so, I had died. One of Poe's many aesthete protagonists who has spent most of his life sequestered in a study where the realities of the world affected me as visions only. And where the wild ideas of the land of dreams became his sole existence, Aegeus awakens to a new disorder of the brain, an obsession with the white and ghastly spectrum of the teeth. Teeth dreams, in the Freudian sense, represent fears of castration. But in this particular text, teeth are instead the focus of Aegeus's monomania. The reader is captivated, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and forced to share in the fracturing of Aegeus's psyche. The teeth, the teeth, they were here and there and everywhere and visibly palpable before me long, narrow and excessively white, with the pale lips writhing about them. Poe's use of the word writhing is particularly telling in this instance, connoting as it does the movement of a snake. The creature symbolic of the most powerful image of feminine monstrousness in all of mythology, the Medusa. The Medusa as femme castratrice controls the gaze, the male victim being her object. But in Benice, this trope is inverted. Benice is never other than passive. The sadistic gaze is controlled by her cousin Aegeus. Yes, the coaster came with the glass. Couldn't have written that. For hours after Benice has left his study, Aegeus remains fixated upon the phantasma of the teeth, most vivid and hideous. Eventually, he is roused from his mental torpor by the news that Benice has succumbed to a fatal epileptic seizure and is to be buried at the close of the following day. There follows an abrupt break in the narrative, commensurate with the psychotic break of the protagonist. Suddenly Aegeus awakes, once again in his study, in a state of utter confusion. He is unable to recall the last few hours, only that he had done a deed, with the piercing shriek of a female voice ringing in his ears. He discovers a little box next to him, and a book of poetry by Ebn Zayat open with a particular phrase underlined. My companions told me I might find some little alleviation in my misery in visiting the grave of my beloved. Benice has been mistakenly buried alive by the household who are ignorant of the symptoms of epileptic catatonia 
and it is while Aegeus is somnambulistically extracting each of her 32 teeth, small white and ivory looking substances, that she regains consciousness. Poe makes no attempt to explain the nature of a person who could perform such a hideous act, nor does he attempt to pass any kind of judgment. He simply suggests that madness is an aspect of a higher awareness outside literal reality. Madness, driven by monomania, creates in Aegeus an awareness of what has subconsciously been repressed. The need for the removal of the vagina dentata, the threat of feminine monstrousness as castratrice of emasculation. Benice is ultimately reduced to that which can be contained, a small box of teeth and dental instruments. Her monstrous beauty and unheimlich sexuality are grotesquely disfigured in an act of perverted oral castration, culminating in the destruction of both Aegeus's muse and his mental equilibrium. Story number two. Rather than a linear narrative, Legia is a foray into metempsychosis, a study of transcendence, and once again features the psychological condition of monomania. It concerns the nature of existence after death. For much of Poe's fiction shows an interest in the possibility that an individual personality might continue after death, either through an effort of will or by some extraneous means. The survival after death in some form of physical continuance is the animating principle of the story Legia. Each of the women in this tale is reduced to the sum of her physical features. The feminine fragmented into its constituent parts, objectified and fetishized. Legia's exquisite beauty is dwelt upon at length to the point of idolatry Eyes, mouth, hair and skin are fetishized to an intensely psychological degree in passages that continue for whole pages. In contrast, the Lady Rowena Trevanion is diminished to a few words, fair haired and blue eyed. In the ultimate act of containment, she is denied even the privilege of speech within the text. In Legia, the focus of obsession is the eyes. They become a cynic joke for the lady herself. Poe claimed that the tale was inspired by a dream in which he saw nothing but female eyes. And it is perhaps significant that one of the only known images of Poe's mother, Eliza, an illustration currently housed in the Valentine Museum in Richmond, Virginia, features a young lady whose eyes are so large that their prominence dwarfs the rest of her features. The narrator's description of his wife's eyes continues for more than one and a half pages. The large eyes of Legia, for which we have no models in the remotely antique, something more profound than the well of Democritus, which lay far within the pupils of my beloved. Poe's narrator goes to great lengths to describe the marriage to Legia as a communion of souls, endowing her with the ethereality of a deity. Her presence rendered vividly luminous the many mysteries of transcendentalism in which we were immersed. Her immense learning is so utterly gigantic that the narrator is sufficiently aware of her infinite supremacy to resign myself with a childlike confidence to her guidance through the chaotic world of metaphysical examination. Poe delineates a relationship so obsessive that it transcends time and ultimately death itself. 
Ligia inevitably wastes away in the prime of her youth and beauty, of course, and the motifs of repression and imprisonment are represented both in the narrator's insistence on existing within the realm of memory rather than physicality, Ligia, the beloved, the august, the beautiful, the entombed, and in containing the second wife, Rowena, entirely to one room a bridal chamber, ornamented with the paraphernalia of death. Here, Eros and Thanatos are linked irrevocably in Rowena's containment within a matrimonial funeral parlour. The chamber has been specifically decorated by the narrator in black and gold, containing ebony furniture with pall-like canopies and giant sarcophagi of black granite standing on each end in each corner. Ligia's betrayal of the narrator by abandoning their spiritual union via an early death is translated into an abhorrence by him of his second wife. The narrator loathes Rowena with a hatred belonging more to a demon than to a man recalling Aegeus's feelings of contempt for his cousin Bernice. Consequently, Rowena shuns her husband and wastes away in her turn, suffering fever and violent convulsions that attack her frame at all times feeble and emaciated. It is the border which is central to the construction of the monstrous, the border between human and non-human, corporeality and incorporeality. That which crosses or threatens to cross the border is abject, for it is at the border that the monstrous is produced. The haunting of Rowena Trevanion heralds the proximity of that border and the coming of feminine monstrousness that is Legia. Rowena hears things and sees things that narrator in his opium fugue does not at first observe until at last he becomes aware of a faint indefinite shadow of angelic aspect which introduces three or four large drops of a brilliant and ruby colored liquid into Rowena's medicinal goblet. The blood of Legia as Christ acts as a macabre transference of the Eucharist, causing not life, but a metempsychosis. Rowena dies, is enshrouded for the tomb, and the narrator sits with her body in the bridal chamber of death, where he again gave myself up to passionate waking visions of Legia. A night of terror ensues in which the border between corporeality and incorporeality is continually breached. A repeated hideous drama of revivification until the metempsychosis is complete. Are these the throes of the dying body struggling to live or the living body struggling to die? This violation is perpetrated upon one female by another, a violent transcendence that begins with the invasion and ends in transmogrification. Legia's last words in life had been, man doth not yield him to the angels, nor unto death utterly, save only through the weakness of his feeble will. Does Legia reappear in Rowena's body because she wishes to return to her husband or because her husband wishes her to return? In this instance, containing feminist monstrousness has in fact released monstrousness. The unheimlich act of metempsychosis ushers in the return of the monstrous sexuality of Legia monstrous in its devouring consummation of another female. After the narrator has physically contained Rowena, she is then corporeally contained by Legia as the conduit through which she may return. The ambiguous nature of this story is such that the reader is left wondering exactly what 
had been repressed and to what end before emerging in a state calculated to cause shock and dread. The dead are never wholly dead and Poe comforts himself with dreams of revenants. Last story. Etymologically speaking, the monster is something that serves to demonstrate from the Latin monstraire and to warn in Latin monere. From classical times, monsters were interpreted either as signs of divine anger or as portents of impending disasters. To be a monster is to be an omen, a portent of the future, a display of God's wrath, a symbol of moral vice or an accident of nature. The epitome of feminine monstrousness, Madeline Usher, serves to act as both monstraire and monaire. She is a portent of the moral and literal fall of the Usher line and its house. The fall of the House of Usher is one of Poe's most powerful and enduring works. It exploits the very Gothic idea of the degenerate legacy of a decaying aristocracy. The story is a veritable thesaurus of Gothic cliches. Lonely wanderer, dreary landscape, decaying castle, demented genius, sickly spectral sister, and some critics have read into the tale an incestuous attachment between Roderick and Madeline. However, Roderick needs to contain his sister in order to perpetuate the Usher line. Her decease, he said, with a bitterness which I can never forget, would leave him the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the Ushers. But it is Roderick Usher's psychological instability and encroaching psychotic breakdown that are ultimately what terminates the lineage. Roderick suffers from a malady described as a constitutional and a family evil, and one for which he despaired to find a remedy. One could be forgiven for assuming that the malady in question is syphilis, a scourge of families throughout the 19th century, and a trope favoured by writers such as Max Nordau, Sarah Grand and Henrik Ibsen. But Roderick is in fact portrayed as being afflicted with neurasthenia to the point of psychological instability, a form of moral insanity passed down through generations of his family. The Usher line dates back many centuries and the family estate is a secluded mansion of gloom by a dank lake in the mountains. Roderick and his twin sister Madeline are the last of their line. Lacking collateral issue, they are recluses ensconced in a bygone world which has now fallen into a state of desuetude. Roderick knows that he will not survive much longer. I shall perish, I must perish. And he invites an unnamed school friend, the narrator, for a prolonged visit in order to alleviate the mental disorder which oppressed him. Roderick is portrayed as cultured, oversensitive, and a scholar of the esoteric. Some biographers conjecture that he is partly a portrait of Poe himself a melancholic aesthete whose eccentricities alienated him from the rest of society. Usher is what we might now term a manic depressive or one suffering from bipolar tendencies with a strong element of hysteria in his depression. His moods swing unpredictably between desolation and ecstasy without warning leaving both the narrator and the reader in a state of anxiety as to how Roderick's debilib debilitated mental fabric will dictate the plot of the tale. Usher is cadaverous in appearance and the passage which describes his suffering from a morbid acuteness of the senses recalls the character of Aegeus from Bernice. 
the most insipid food alone endurable. He could wear only garments of a certain texture. The odors of all flowers were oppressive. His eyes were tortured by even a faint light. Think Vincent Price in sunglasses. And there were but peculiar sounds and these from stringed instruments, which did not inspire him with horror. However, this delineation of Usher is more rarefied than that of Aegeus, indicating that in the four years separating the two tales, Poe had refined the aesthetic component of his character development. The almost vampiric imagery is extended to Roderick's twin sister, Madeline, another narcoleptic, and yet another beautiful young woman suffering from a wasting disease. Her presence, although she is only glimpsed alive on two occasions by the narrator, permeates the house. Her mysterious hold over her brother is such that after her initial death, Roderick insists on preserving her body in one of the many vaults beneath the mansion for two weeks prior to her official interment. As Roderick and the narrator convey her body to the designated place of repose, there is noticed a faint blush upon the bosom and the face and that suspiciously lingering smile upon the lip, which is so terrible in death. Madeline dwells at the border, her unheimlich monstrousness rendered abject. This scene seems to anticipate Bram Stoker's Lucy Westenra, another beautiful young woman punished for a monstrous sexuality, who after dying, subsequent to being seduced by Count Dracula, lies in repose with skin the colour of marble, except for a faint blush upon her cheeks and a rictus smile, only to return in order to prey upon children in the guise of the bluefer lady. Indeed, as Roderick and Madeline are twins, the reader could be forgiven for wondering if they have in fact been feeding from each other. The advancement of their consumption having occurred in mirror-like parallel. Madeline's body is placed in a copper coffin, which in turn is deposited into a vault with an iron door used by previous generations of ushers as a torture chamber. According to the seven noble elements of the ancients, recorded by the 18th century Benedictine librarian Dom Antoine Joseph Panetti in Dictionnaire Mytho Hermetique of 1758. This is a real book, by the way. Copper was associated with eternal feminine youth and iron was regularly used as a ward against ghosts and spirits. This coupled with Roderick's preferred reading material each of which has been documented by historians as real publications with which Poe was familiar, includes Tommaso Campania's City of the Sun of 1602, a theocratic work based on the principles of physiognomy and the immortality of the soul, Emanuel Swedenborg's Heaven and Hell of 1758, describing the afterlife and how one may continue to exist after corporeal death, and Nicholas Eimerich's Directorium Inquisitorium, 1376, a treatise on sorcery, signifying that Roderick took steps to ensure that Madeline and all she represents was properly contained. However, the threat of feminine monstrousness remains. Subsequent to Madeline's premature transferal to the vault, the narrator has nightmares of an incubus sitting on his chest. Indeed, Henri Fusli's The Nightmare, originally painted in 1782, is directly alluded to earlier in the text. Roderick, already extremely psychologically unstable, descends into madness, claiming to hear signs of his sister's impending return. 
the return of what he has attempted to repress and contain. During a tempest, a favoured Gothic trope, the narrator reads aloud the tale of the mad tryst of Sir Launcelot Canning, the one purely fictional work mentioned in this story, in a misguided attempt to distract Dasher from his deepening psychosis. This metafiction is the creation of Poe's, during which sounds and effects occurring in the central story become transmuted into those of Madeline's escape from the coffin and vault in the framing narrative, enhancing the unheimlich nature of the events portended. Madeline was a part of himself which Roderick felt bound to destroy, and she in turn seeks her brother, returning from the border from whence her abjection is magnified in feminine monstrousness. For a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in her violent and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse, a victim to the terrors he had anticipated. Madeline Usher is the feminine monstrousness that could not be contained, serving both to demonstrate a divine anger, monstraire, and the presumption of one who seeks knowledge beyond the border of the corporeal, and to warn of impending disaster, monair. With her unheimlich return, the House of Usher is rent asunder, and engulfed by the pestilential waters of the surrounding tarn. Unable to sustain itself any longer, the noble line of Usher becomes extinct. In each of these tales, as in much of Poe's fiction, women have been othered by men who retain only a tenuous grip on reality, men who are comprised by emasculation, and thus must contain feminist monstrousness, lest it threaten the patriarchal milieu. Objectified and fetishized to an extreme degree, Bernice, Legia, Rowena and Madeline are examples of the abject, symbolizing the unheimlich and the subsequent necessity for repression. Each of Poe's male protagonists seems curiously removed from physical passion or any vestige of empathy. When they are overcome with emotion, they become corpse-like. The blood congealing in the veins of Aegeus while reading the words of Eben Zayat in Benice, the interrupted heartbeat and rigid limbs of the narrator in Legia upon the revivification of Rowena and the sight of Madeline Usher sending that story's narrator into a stupor. The ch this chimes with the notion that these are instances of an unheimlich monstrousness channeled through the feminine, highlighting male repression and psychological instability, and thus the need for containment. Benice is reduced to a monstrous vagina dentata, whose containment is guaranteed by the removal of her teeth, small white and ivory substances that are deposited into a small box on Aegeus's desk. The Lady Rowena becomes a conduit for the unheimlich return of the deified Legia, the entity who perverts the Eucharist in an act of female on female violation with the aim of transcending the physical barriers to spiritual metempsychosis. And Madeline Usher, both monstre and monair, must be contained by her brother using principles outlined within the seven noble elements of the ancients in an attempt to avert a decease which would leave him, him the hopeless and the frail, the last of the ancient race of the Ushers. The perceived feminine abandonment and thus betrayal, which had become a pattern of Poe's life, was one which he aimed to subvert through the vehicle of fiction. 
the link between Eros and Thanatos undergirds these stories in which in a mirror of Poe's own life, each woman wastes away during the prime of her beauty, thus denied and denying the possibility of nurturing the male. In fiction, Poe was able to resurrect and to an extent contain the monstrous loves of his male protagonists. The death of a beautiful woman is the most poetical topic in the world, but only if one is able to contain the feminine monstrousness which lies beneath such beauty. The end. Thank you, Tracy.